I just wanted to put together this panel just kind of out of personal interest and curiosity and also um, just like thinking, I guess, like as a writer myself, like how I could be telling stories about music in ways that are better or more interesting or more creative that kind of like um, incorporate like all of the other artistic practices of people that I know that are like working within this industry and this and that. And I also wanted to, I guess, like celebrate people who I think are doing kind of like interesting storytelling or play interesting roles in kind of like the music media landscape to which I would say hello to all of my panelists and thank you for joining me. Uh, and um, yeah, and I just wanted to, I guess, like have an open discussion about like kind of the constraints of the most commonly used journalistic formats now, um, who we think is doing good storytelling around music. And then I guess kind of like combining different mediums and formats to think about like what experimental or like future forms, and I know experimental is kind of a contentious word, like future forms of music journalism um, could be. And uh, yeah, like I, I, like I also said to the panelists uh, right before, um, I don't want this to be like bogged down in like practicalities. So like, you know, it, it's like not, the not, not, none of these ideas necessarily have to be like tangible. Like doesn't have to be like a business plan for how you could execute like a, an article that has like, you know, whatever, yeah, WhatsApp messages and text and images in it or something like that. It's really just, I guess to like, yeah, um, kind of like drop the, uh, the constraints that I think like the word journalism sometimes puts on music media and I guess like talk a little bit more realistically about um, what is actually happening in so far as like uh, kinds of music media and then like what we could do. So yeah, so that's the spiel. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll let my panelists kind of like introduce themselves and talk a little bit about um, what they do both like in a storytelling context and I know that like all of them wear many hats. So we can, yeah, do you wanna start? Um, I'm gonna start just from the person that I can see directly to my right. So if we can go Lucas, Chris, yeah, and then on like that. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Lukasz Wardawiesławski and uh, yeah, I do or did many things. Um, I started as a blogger, then I founded my own music portal here in Poland, which I've run for maybe two years. Then I moved um, to Krakow to work for Unsound when I was working in the PR and curatorial department. In the meantime, I've hosted a radio show and now I have a label. So many, many angles of um, how to talk um, about music. Cool, Crystal? Hey, I am Crystal. I currently write with Black Band Camp. Um, I also am a co-curator with a mixed series and interview series called Moods along with um, Daniel Shar. And then I also do my own newsletter based off of my creative business called The Minor Agency, which um, isn't like a standard agency, but it's just a way for me to kind of house all of my creative practices. Um, and then I'm also currently a fellow with Groove Magazine based out of Berlin, but I'm in Detroit. Um, and I'm just interested in um, telling stories from music, um, not from a place of authority, but from a place of um, an observer and just a participant. Mm. Cool. Oh yeah, Felipe, sorry, I wasn't sure if uh, actually you guys all see the same yeah. view as me yet. <laughs> Go uh, for it. I see you at the bottom of the screen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my name is Felipe Maya. I'm from Brazil. Actually, I'm in Brazil right now and I'm a freelance journalist. I've written to, uh, I've contributed to many media outlets here in Brazil, in the US, in the UK, in France as well. Vice, the Mescla, UK Africa, Folha de São Paulo, a Brazilian newspaper. Well, and uh, I'm also an ethnomusicologist or sound anthropologist. I'm trying to find the, the right word to, <laughs> to, to, to talk about it, but um, I do research on music on popular music and technology and digital technology. This is quite broad, but still I try to understand right now uh, how paredões uh, play a role in Brazilian soundscape and Brazilian music. Paredões are roughly huge sound systems. So I'm trying to, to understand a little bit more about this device 
And uh, I'm also a DJ. I'm res resident at Rings Friends, where I host a show called Baile. It's a show focused on Baile Funk and other Latin American electronic music, dance music that cross with Baile Funk and also cross with reggaeton and you name it, everything that makes people dance. And that's it. Cool, Gamal. Hi everybody, I'm in New York. My name is Gamal. I run a small boutique PR company for the last 20 years. We've worked with an incredible range of artists, including big names that you would know, people like DJ Rashad, Jay Dilla, uh, Cole Craig, and lots of lots of lots and lots of other people, and, and mainly electronic and primarily independent labels. Um, it's not been about working with big artists and, and chasing those things. It's been about developing younger artists, uh, uh, people like Jaylin, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, as well as doing PR for like over 20 years, I've also worked as a writer, I've worked as a DJ, I've worked as a musician, I've worked as an artist, I've worked record store, you know, endless, endless list of things. Um, and just one thing before we get, get going, um, we were gonna have Sherry from, uh, with us today. She mm -hmm. does a newsletter um, called... Uh, Water and Music. That's it. I just didn't want to get yeah. it wrong. Thanks. Um, and I just recommend everybody go and have a look at that and sign up for it. It's an amazing newsletter in terms of if you want to look at things from a technical point of view, looking at like how companies are developing looking at the economic side of things. It's, it's basically what Billboard should be, but isn't. Um, and I think um, it's a really good resource for everybody to take a look at. And I uh, just want to shout out here and say, I'm sorry that you're not here with us because I would have loved to hear your insight, but we'll just keep reading your wonderful newsletter in the meantime. So, and thank you to everybody for being here and happy to be part of this. Cool. It's because she actually inspired me to start my newsletter with um, some of her writings and like kind of coming from a perspective of starting where you're at and writing about the things that are around you. So yeah, big ups to her. I was, yeah, well, maybe we can get into the, what formats people engage with most because I, I'd love to ask you a question about that. I think it's really interesting as someone who's like, you're starting an editorial platform, you're also working for a larger publication and then you have this newsletter. So I guess like for you, how do you kind of like decide like what stories you wanna bring where, for instance? And then I guess like in the case of the newsletter, I'm really interested, like I've made some terrible newsletter recommendations in the past, uh, <laughs> but uh, I am still really interested in newsletters as a format. Um, I think they're really interesting. And so I guess like when you were reading um, Sherry's work, what kind of like drew you to that as a format? And then as you've, as well, I think you already were kind of writing for other places beforehand, but then how do you kind of like decide which stories you want to bring to, to which like uh, format basically? Oh, uh, and you're asking- That's for Crystal, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. So I think the newsletter just came from I actually hadn't had many bylines by the time that I started it, but I knew that I, I've been kind of writing in, in some way, shape or form um, for the most of my life. Um, but it actually was just quarantine. I was able to um, have a lot more time to myself and to flesh out more thoughts. And I found myself kind of just wanting to tell things that I didn't feel like could fit in a typical um, news pitch, you know, um, it's just, well, this is how I feel about this thing. And this is what I observe from what's happening. Um, and she kind of, I think, really stresses the importance of everybody is an expert at something, you know, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not kind of, I can, even if it, it's not like a technical expert, I'm an expert at the things that I know and that I observe. Um, so I think that it just started off as a way for me to um, highlight and promote um, music that was touching me and kind of like, kind of from like a ethnomusicologist uh, standpoint of like things I was observing um, in my day-to-day -day life living in Detroit. Um, and I think, so the newsletter kind of goes uh, as, as, I, as I'm doing more writing projects, it falls a little bit more to the wayside. I actually don't upkeep it as much as I would like to upkeep it. Mm -hmm. 
and like kind of I think about the stories I want to put there versus the stories um, I want to pitch to other publications and with the artists that I'm working with. Um, so it's, I think I did a piece with, um, uh, why am I forgetting, the portal on a DJ um, producer named Huey Mnemonic who's based in Detroit and that um, I've observed his work for like the past year or so. Um, and I guess when you write about other people's work, um, it falls into a few different categories. You know, are you critiquing it? Are you featuring it? Um, and then for someone whose work I really like support and I believe in, um, I want to be able to pitch that their like sound and like kind of their narrative to, um, I think a publication where they will be like valued and understand. Mm -hmm. understand. Um, you know, um, it's just like, well, this readership like know, um, know about the work and should they know about the work? Um, and then it's also just people I'm meeting. Um, so I'm considering this point in my life is doing field work. I'm doing field work in Detroit on different musicians and I'm interviewing mm -hmm. musicians and I'm writing a lot of things that maybe I will pitch to something bigger. Maybe I won't pitch to something bigger. Um, but it's just finding a publication that I feel like will honor the work that they do. Um, and that's looking like not very traditional um, music, music routes, like kind of like the big, bigger publications, but going into smaller journals um, mm -hmm. and going into more like creative formats of writing. Cause I think that um, music reviewing is like a very, uh, it's a hard field, you know, it's like what gives you the authority to kind of give your yeah. opinion on someone else's like their work, their writing, their art, um, but kind of like feature writing to me feels a little bit more natural because that is just telling the story of a person I find interesting. Mm -hmm. um, find that most people are very interesting. Most musicians are pretty interesting. And while I have a vested interest in telling the stories of, um, women, especially women of color and um, black women, I don't necessarily limit myself to that if I feel like they have a story that um, makes me think in a new way or makes me feel in a new way. So uh, I'm still, I'm, 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 I would consider myself a novice. I think most folks on this panel have had like years and years of experience and I'm still kind of within the first year of publishing anything. Um, but as I kind of discover more about what makes me feel something and how I can share it with other people, um, it feels like I'm doing a bigger puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. This person, it would make sense here, it would make sense here. Or I admire um, the writing I'm seeing coming out of here and I want to like make that connection with those people. Um, so still very much figuring it out. For someone that gravitates more towards like feature writing, for instance, um, and especially since you're like often dealing with artists that like maybe you know or you have like a personal relationship with or you've worked with in some capacity or maybe not, maybe you just like are familiar with their stuff, but especially if there's that interpersonal relationship. If when you're writing that feature, maybe they like just released an EP that you like don't really like or you see a set that's not your favorite, even although you like know holistically the artist is really great and they're this really great person, but you also perhaps you have made this observation, okay, well, there's like a little critique that I would have here. Like, do you find that within the format of a, um, of a feature of a traditional article, so like interview, whatever, written through with a picture, do you find that that like allows either the format or I guess like your editors or the publications that you're working with, that that allows for you to like also be a little bit critical or do you think that like then, then it becomes like difficult if you have something to say for you to be able to say it in that, in that sense. And I love that you brought it up kind of the conflict of interest that comes with living mm. the money that you're writing about. Um, Cause I feel like as, um, you know, a journalist, it is my duty to kind of critique, to critique the things that I see that come up. But I think rather than critiquing the art, I'm trying to build a um, theory and a new way of critique around kind of like social structures within music and especially, especially mm -hmm. like what we would consider black music. Um, and that's kind of, I think, 
I'm doing it in small ways. So, you know, one day I can do something that's a little bit bigger and that's, that can actually generate like a new framework of being rather than just a critique. Cause I think it's easy to say, I don't like this thing, but it's like, how can we improve on this thing as a whole? And I don't think that you can really critique someone's music um, in a way that generates them to make better music. It's just gonna kind of like generate like a- A very interesting point. Yeah, you know, it's like, you're not gonna, like they're not gonna read this and be like, wow, I need to up my game. It's always gonna be an issue of ego, but if you kind of generate um, a critique around kind of the social and cultural um, elements that are going into the music making, I think that you can do a little bit of a better work with how far you can go with that critique. What does everybody else uh, think of that? I think that's a really interesting point that you just made. What does everybody else um, think of the of this idea that Crystal just brought up? Well, you know, talking about things in context and, you know, examining something in a local context, I think Detroit's really suffered by not having black writers, you know, and by not having a diversity of writers there. You know, I mean, I've worked with, so many different Detroit artists. I worked with Carl Craig for over 10 years. I worked with Anthony Sheikh Shakir. I worked with Amp Fiddler. You know, I have pretty good experience of what the media is like in Detroit. You know, I did press for the first year of the Detroit Electronic Music Festival. You know, I've been closely tied to the city in many ways. And that community perspective is always going to be different to, uh, somebody kind of slightly adjacent to it or completely removed from it in Europe. And thus, thus the local is, is really important. And I think one of, the, one of the things we are seeing throughout coronavirus is people realizing the value of their local scenes because they have to. You mm -hmm. know, for example, I'm in New York and you know, there's a huge wealth of talent here, but obviously a lot of things are focused around bringing in people from other places. And that's the, that gets a lot of the prime time from everybody and locals don't always get as much, as much exposure as they, as they should, even in a big city like this where you think they would, you know? So it, it's crucial. I think one of the interesting things to think about here in, in what was just said is there's an old school journalistic approach to things and we're very much like in a new school approach era right now. And we were already in a new school approach era prior to COVID. A lot of people like myself have been looking at the models around us and we realize that they have been broken forever. I mean, they've just been broken. They've never been good. Let's just face it. Music criticism, music the discussions around music have never been great. It's always, they've always, always been problematic, especially when it comes to discussing music made by people of color, music made by black people, music made by people outside of the Western key places, you know, Central Europe and England and America. And, you know, so to move, to get to the point here, the idea of being a journalist old school idea was you, you would be detached from your subject and being too close to your subject is kind of a no-no. And the reality mm -hmm. is that's ridiculous. People mix and get to know each other and that kind of closeness happens. The ethics, the ethics are upon the writer. You know, in this case, what you were talking about is taking a new artist and contextualizing in the city that they live in, in the scene that they live in. I mean, that's, that's a, I think that's a good way to do it. And then, you know, just admitting, hey, you know, we are in the, in the same milieu, we are in the same place. Uh, it's a lot of pressure on the writer, writer to be objective, but, you know, this idea that, you know, objectivity removes you completely, you know, it's been one of the downfalls and it was always one of the downfalls and was always one of the most annoying, horrible things to deal with. The fact that people would not talk about socio-political issues they would not talk about economic realities. They would not talk about historical context. I and mean, we could just go on the list of things that people wouldn't deal with. And this is why largely we are where we are today, where so many people are really disillusioned with press, period. Not just music press, media overall. Mm. People this stuff, I mean, like this, today, 
The Guardian did a hand, headline, you know, the whitest, the, you know, the radio headline. Did everybody see this? This, no. this headline? Let me just pull it up so I get <laughs> that right wording because I don't want to. Okay, well, while the radio head link is sourced, uh, <laughs> um, I would say yes. So I, I guess, Felipe, um, just to go back to Crystal's point about um, kind of like whether or not you can actually like critique music to make it better. And then I guess um, if, well, I'm interested to know like if you agree with that, what your thoughts are. And then if you think no, um, I guess, is there a way to kind of like critique like well, then I guess what is the point of critique and like what are the points of critique that are oh my god that's such a big question what is the point of critique sorry you don't have to answer that. that's insane that's insane <laughs> no, so let's just start from the beginning do you think you can critique music to make it better because I'm really I, I really think that that's like a super salient point and I think it also like wraps into this whole discussion from all that you were just saying to do with objectivity and all of this stuff because if we're looking to like go to the future of like well you know, realistically, like even the people that you're friends with that you love the most, the scenes that you're most involved with, nothing is above critique, you know, no heroes. So how can you critique things in a way that has some sort of point or that does actually like, is out of love of the thing getting better as opposed to like finger wagging, I guess. And what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think Lucas, before, if you could give I, I think back. before Gamal wants to, to say something, don't you? Thank Gamal you. Thank you, don't yeah. mind. I just want to finish the radio, I think. There, there was, yeah. We're talking about, just quickly, about how media has been broken. And today, the headline in The Guardian was, why Radiohead are the blackest white band of our times. This was, <laughs> this was the headline. I mean, you know... Okay, yeah, let's... <laughs> I mean, let's not discuss it, but I'm just saying, that's, that's a prime example of how off track things can get. And, and that still happened, that happened today, that's this morning. It's I not- think things are very off track over there and in like the major publications thing that I think like, that's why I'm so interested in, I guess like, because I think that like, while a lot of attention is paid to like this like big, like while everybody's like paying a lot of attention, which is absolutely needs to be happening for like larger institutions and this kind of stuff, which are like, have not been doing a good job. I would say like, on the other hand, I'm also really interested to like parallel to that. There are like, there are all of these different forms of storytelling that have just like come up through the kind of like cracks because like people want, like it's if you love music, you want to like respond to it. You want to be like on, taking notes and doing like a larger view. You are already within your communities talking about it. You want to like express that and share it. So there are all of these other forms of of what I would consider storytelling. Yeah, like uh, DJ commentary, like DJs talking through their radio shows or like an interview series, like means all of these kinds of like different things, which uh, have been chugging along this whole time, but maybe like not with the resource to like develop their full potential or just like people have not been paying attention or it's not been considered. And this is why I think words like journalism become like, extremely contentious because the word journalist is also scary like I don't know am I a journalist like I have no training so I don't know if I can call myself that like it's a freaky word it's not very approachable but anyway let's uh maybe go back to this like point about critique and then we can get it there's so much to talk about when it comes to this thing it's hard to not go off the rails kind of (laughs) Yeah, true. Do we have like three hours? So uh, uh, <laughs> no, let's stick to the schedule. Um, yeah. Well, this this is a super tricky question because I, myself, I, I don't consider myself a critic. A, I don't do criticism when I try to do journalism or writing, music writing, you name it. Um, I think I, I try to stick with the, the, the idea of bringing something new to the readers, to the viewers, to the listeners. Uh, you talk, you, you talked about DJing. Um, as a DJ in this show, in Rings Friends, I used to talk over some songs, some tracks, because I, f- I feel that I'm presenting something new to a francophone audience. People know something about Baile Fine because there's MC Fiocchi tune or something like that. And so my duty, once I'm there, is trying to explain something as a person that, uh, uh, incidentally, it comes from Brazil. Um, when we think about criticism as a platform to making someone's music better, I think that doesn't work at all. Uh, I think artists, they work 
on their own mindset and maybe they will read something and they will use it as an input for what they're doing as a job. But um, one, once you think about journalism nowadays, I think criticism, reviewing is not a thing that people are looking for because music's everywhere. It's a, such a commodity, it's such a cheap commodity. Uh, the thing about criticism and reviewing maybe made sense back in the days when Baudelaire used to do criticism of operas or in the 80s when the guys used to do criticism. Like, I do believe that criticism is a quite cool tool to bring up something new. But me, myself personally, I'm much more interested in bringing feature stories, bringing the backbone of some movement culture or throwing some lights or where there's none. Um, well, I think that's it. Uh, and uh, maybe, I don't know, my colleagues can talk a little bit more about it. Lucas, do you have, uh, do you have anything to say on this point? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll defend criticism a bit. Like it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not the, uh, the primary uh, thing I'm looking for, but I think if there's a really good writer who knows uh, a lot about the thing that uh, they're critiquing, it can be a really interesting uh, read, like a sport, in its own and it's yeah it's kind of detached from the music and some of the most interesting critiques i read were actually more about i don't know literature than music but they were still very uh, very interesting reads and there should be a place for them and i know they're really hard to come by and uh you would need a very skilled trained writer and a budget and uh, and a place that would actually be now willing to take this risk to to publish something that's like super long and uh, maybe like one percent of their audience will um, read but uh, it would be nice if it wouldn't uh, disappear but personally yeah I'm also um, more interested in this like more personal approach and um, seeing the person in the actual piece and I had this thought about the radio recently like in this um, in this pandemic time and all those streams, like the, the DJs streaming mm -hmm. their, their sets, like trying to um, create this uh, this feeling of, of being together, but they actually the voice is lacking. I think that they, they, you see you see the person, but you, you're not really interacting with uh, mm -hmm. with the audience. Like I really love this huge stream by DJ Iz when he was like a full radio host mode, and actually, I, I, is, is the the stream that I was most engaged with and it, I, I think it's very rare and I'm kind of long for this uh, this style of, of hosting a show it's I would say more old school because right now it's just most like a podcast there's hour of music a jingle like hey this is a DJX at Rinse FM or NTS or, or something and um, yeah this this like this personal approach I think uh, it's very important for me I would love to see it more yeah, just, just to make myself clear, I don't think that criticism is a bad thing at all. It's just the thing, I don't see criticism as, a, as an interesting thing nowadays. Uh, thinking of the criticizer, the writer that will look to some music in a detached way, or just like uh, he's looking for some, he's seeing something from the top, and uh, he doesn't know or she doesn't know uh, anything else that could be interesting to bring on the text or the video. Uh, I, I think that criticism is a, is a real thing and uh, I love to read it when it brings something new to, my, to myself, when it brings something that I don't care or I didn't listen to uh, in my first listen. It's, yeah, it's very interesting because like, I, I mean, okay. Because it seems like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm also on board, of course, for like criticism. And I think that's why like this whole format thing is kind of how I wanted to like, what I wanted to kind of like pin the conversation to just like just as a jumping off point, because like all of the gripes that we're expressing are like with the format and the framing of like reviews and criticism, for instance. So it's like, yeah, well, like it's written as a product review and you're saying, okay, well, music is like really easily accessible and also like, but and so we know that you're not like reading it so that you would buy the record and then what is the point of the criticism and like crystal was saying are you trying to like critique it to improve the song like they're not going to go in and like remake it you know like that's not going to happen and so and then it's like are you always bringing new things i think this is where pr comes into it because it's like a lot of the time the only information that you have from an unreleased record without an interview is i guess like from the pr so like and that's like very much like filtered by who your pr is 
and how they're like choosing to frame things. But I guess like just to, to zero back in. So to take, I guess, like what we like of the existing format or what works when you read like a really good record review or if you can remember reading one, uh, I guess like what are what are things that you like about it? Is it like is it like hearing things in a different way, or like what are the sensations, or what are the what do you get when you read like a good record review out of it? And then I guess maybe we can talk about like those like core elements and how they could be like worked into other things or focused on more so that it works. Yeah, uh, Crystal, do you want to start, and then we can go through. Um, I would say. I, I've never read a review that, um, I don't read reviews to inspire me to buy a, a, an album or, or mm -hmm. not, you know what I mean? It's never mm -hmm. been, this is how I find my music. I find music and, you know, I'll do my research on the artist and I'll read what comes up on the artist or if I'm interested in the artist, I'll keep up with kind of any um, writing that comes out around them. But I feel, it, and it comes back to a feelings thing rather than like a technical element of it and I feel like that's something that has been often utilized um in kind of these more rigid like ideas of journalism like this is like just like a you know very technical it's scientific it's fact-based rather than um emotion ba emotional emotion based and I feel like I want to read things that are more based in like um feelings and based on emotions and based on kind of the human connection to the music that is being heard or being listened to um, so I guess, you know, I always want to hate on podcasts, but I actually love podcasts. Um, and Underground and Black, Ash Lauren does a podcast series of RA. And I feel like that is pretty crucial to the preservation and documentation um, of a lot of stories that we um, haven't heard before from kind of like the uh, Black artists from Detroit. Um, and I feel, you know, when we think about underground music, um, it's underground, you know, it's not supposed to be something widely known. It's not something be, to be commercialized, but I feel like within that, we are also not documenting things that need to be documented for um, future generations. And I feel like that podcast does like a really wonderful job of documenting things. Um, I think recently she interviewed Wajid and before that it was DJ Minks. Um, just people who have affected the culture um, and do have interesting stories and stories that I think that can be useful to um, future generations who are coming into the music and coming into the work. Um, so yeah, I think podcast formats are great because you hear it straight from the lips of the artists. And I think that as long as like a venture is um, artist led, um, it, is doing a service to the art. I really, really resonate with what you say about, yeah, journalism coming from music journalism, music media journalism also, again, like, yeah, I know perhaps journalism is the wrong word. Cause I, I also think that the word journalism does kind of like can wreck things a little bit sometimes because of course, I mean, music is like a visceral thing. It's like a feeling based thing. It's a, it's a, and so, of course, you would be writing from like a visceral perspective. Like I always think of music journalism as dancing, kind of. It's like when you hear a song you really like, you want to respond. I'm really terrible at dancing. So like mm -hmm. maybe you want to write a review or something. You want to be involved in, in, in what's happening somehow. And, and so I, I also agree. And I think that podcasts also are like an amazing piece of like tool for journalism, not only because they can exist like in audio, people can listen to it as they're like walking around, but also it's something that can be transcribed. It can be like turned into an article later. It's kind of like, it's like this like raw material that also people can work with maybe. Yeah. Um, so that's, so that's um, really cool. Um, okay. Felipe, do you want to, do you want to go? Yeah. I'm not that podcast guy, but I do love one podcast. And I think that's the, the, uh, what what one could expect of a good podcast is this one by BBC uh, that talks about actually it tells the story about uh, the Clash and uh, it's amazing it's an amazing like the, the Clash like London calling yeah yeah <laughs> okay. so, sorry about that yeah no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah and uh, yeah it's it's amazing uh, how this this podcast it really caught me up because um, it's a really 
well done radio work. And I think this is the thing also, podcasts comes from radio and uh, we're not reinventing the wheel, reinventing the fire when you do podcasts. But the good thing about podcasts though, it, it is its accessibility. A lot of people can do podcasts. You don't need a radio dial station to, to be with. So this is pretty cool and I, uh, and I love this. This is also a thing that I love about newsletters. Uh, we just talked about this and um, Absolutely, yeah. the, the newsletters are, they, they totally open new horizons for journalists, for music writers, anything you want to be, because uh, you can write from, um, from a really first person point of view and uh, you don't have to be ensuring any kind of attachment with newsrooms or brands whatsoever. Yet it, posed, it brings us the question of um, how to make a living out of this. But I think this is another thing we can speak about. I don't know if my colleagues How can... Yeah, how to make a living and how, I guess like my, well, I want to go back to this original critique question, so I'm, I'm, I'm I, it's still in there. I promise we haven't gone off of it too much, but I do also think, like with newsletters, like not only how can you make a living. I guess there are supporter models and some people that does seem to work for, but then also uh, how how like do you prefer like at a certain point does it become also constricting to be writing without an editor? Because I think for me, as like someone who like I have benefited a lot over these just because I have no formal training from like editors, like literally just te- like, you know, how str- like, didn't you, you didn't think of this or like, I can see you're spiraling and you're like, this is just completely insane. So like, maybe you need to zero in on this one point kind of thing. Um, but then it's, but then, but that's what we could think. Like we, you don't necessarily need to be, have a larger publication to have an editor. Is there like a community sourcing way of doing that? Anyway, but let's, so let's go back to this, um, this question of, I guess, like when you read a record review, um, that's good. What do you get out of it? Or what do you like? Um, Cause I, in my mind, there's a few points that are gonna join together eventually at the end of this. So yeah. I promise we're getting somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, me personally, as I told before, I, I look to new things, new stories that come with the music. Uh, music's not a thing isolated from anything else. We've would probably know that. So once um, mm. I read a review or something like that, I want to be sure that uh, I will know more about the music, the artists, but not in a sense isolated from what's going on in their country, region, or community. This is an interesting thing also because today we're talking about non territoriality music. I mean, music doesn't belong just to a single place. It can, can be like that, but uh, we have communities like I don't know, grime community that is spanning all over, all over the world, rap community, which is huge. So I think that it, was, it, it, it really resonates with me when I can read some article, story, or review that bring on, brings on all these kind of um, elements that uh, are somehow hided behind the music. Okay, so you're looking for the journalist to basically like bring out so the origin of like maybe the genre, like picking apart yeah. if it's like an amalgamation of genres. And then I guess like potentially proposing a new artist or a new angle on that artist, right? I think like where this becomes, I mean, I'm totally with you on that. I'd be interested, Gamal, to get your thoughts on this. So then I guess like in the case where maybe you have an artist who's released a lot of work and has been written about and they have like a new release, how could you kind of like write a review that would like pose new information about that person? Like, would it be doing like a short interview or like, is there a, I don't know, how would you come up with it? Kamal, you've done both writing and PR. So how would you like approach a situation like that? Do you think it's possible? And then at a certain point, is it like, does a review of an artist that's been written about a bunch of times, even if it's like a new piece of work, um, is it necessary or what if that person has already had a feature, but they're putting something new? I don't know. What do you think? I think one of the fundamental issues with where reviews have gone and where reviews have been for a long time is if, say for example, let's look at The Wire, you've got like three different levels of reviews in The Wire, you've got these really Mm -hmm. short reviews in, in the back of special, what they consider specialized music, a lot of time dance music, electronic music, this, that, or the other. You've got longer full page reviews, and then you've got like, you know, one third of a column kind of review. Mm-hmm. Now, 
the smaller the space that you have to write a review, the less likely it's going to be to have something really useful in it, I think. And I think contextually, like what we need from a review now in 2020 is very different to what we've needed before. Like, I don't need to read somebody describing the music anymore because we can literally most times go and play the music somewhere, you know? So we don't need somebody to describe the music. Do you find that you hear different, just, just genuine curiosity, do you find that when you do read an article that's like the approach is very much like, uh, I'm a poet and like, here's my like 40 sentence long description of this like stab or something. Do you find that sometimes in some cases that does help you hear different things or, or not really? I'll give you a good example of, of somebody right now doing, some, doing different things with reviews in a really interesting way. And it's here in New York, it's a jazz musician, he's called Ethan Iverson. Uh, it's ethaniverson.com, that's I-V-E-R. S-O-N, he's a jazz musician, jazz pianist. Um, he writes about jazz and he'll go back and he'll do like, he, his approach is very much like a musician's approach. So I, I just was reading something of his this morning where he picked like, I think seven or eight different records from his collection around the theme of classical music and jazz kind of combined. And it's a really interesting selection and in the way that he talks about things He's very much from a player's perspective and, he, and there's musicology in his reviews. And it's really refreshing reading what, how he presents these things because it's coming from a point of view of a professional and a listener and a passionate viewpoint. And he's intentionally trying to find something new to talk about and a new way to present things and a new way to get people to engage with work. And this is the thing with, review, with, with reviews, there's all kinds of things that you can do in a review. You can talk about the socio-political context, you can talk about how it relates to other things within that genre, you can talk about how it relates to literature, how it relates to film, how it relates mm. to art. I mean, but the fact is, most of the time we don't have reviewers with those skills to be able to like mm. discuss a book in relation to, to a release or discuss a film or discuss Broader, broader subjects, we don't have writers who go and do their research and know the historical context for things. They don't understand how, you know, an Amphila record will relate to Jay Diller, will relate to Moody Man, will relate to other soul artists from 30, 40 years ago, will relate to Wajid, will relate to, you know, com things completely different, you know? And it's, it's um, and, you know, reviews have just started to fade because there isn't that deeper meaning in them. There isn't that deeper information in them, you know, and they, they're not that enjoyable to read. We can just, you know, I, I find most of the time you read a review, especially short reviews, beyond telling you that the record is out, they're not really doing much, you know, and, that, and, that, and it's cool that people are telling you that records are out because it's, there is literally so much amazing music. And I think in the last five years, the quality of music and the amount of music being, uh, being made has just literally exploded, that it is now impossible for anyone to keep up with every development in music, especially if somebody like me who listens across the board to so many different genres of music and is always continually questing for new and old recordings and trying to you know, recontextualize things and understand music in different ways and listening to music in different ways. You know, we're in, we're in a golden age for music. At the same point, music criticism is is retiring and going off into some little black hole, and it's 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 sad and frustrating. And I think, you know, there's a there's hope because there are people looking at new models. And I, I'm going. I want to just diverge a little bit here. You know, Felipe brought up newsletters. A couple of you brought up newsletters. Now I have to think. I did a little research for this specifically about newsletters because there's a newsletter I really like. Um, it's run by a guy Joshua in Chicago. It's called Tone Glow. Now, yeah. one of the reasons I really like it, when we talk about music journalism, I think one of the things that people don't want to talk about too much is the idea of taste, you know? And I think for me, working as a publicist for many years, there's always clearly been writers who have taste, who are generally passionate. They're out there searching for music, whether you're sending it to them or not. They're looking, they're listening, 
they're absorbed and they've got their own idea of style, they've got their own idea of taste. And I think this is an example of somebody from that kind of thing trying to do something. Now, Joshua gave me some really interesting figures because I'm looking at what he's doing and I'm kind of shocked at the volume of stuff that he's doing. And I mean, primarily they're doing interviews and they're doing interviews very close to releases. I mean, and they're doing a shocking number of big, long, long, long interviews. Um, and I asked him, you know, how, what's the back end for you? You know, like, what does it really look like? You know, because I think the reality is there has always been a huge amount of people working from a passion viewpoint. You know, they work in a really absorbed with music and they're working for the passion. They're not getting paid. It's not sustainable. It's not a living. It's, it's something they do along with 20 other things that they do, you know? And I love those people, but reality is we also need economic models at work and we need new models that work economically and we need new models that are more inclusive and new voices the more inclusive of the voices that haven't been heard, you know, especially for women, people of color, black people, it's really crucial that there is, people pay attention to what has gone on this year and start to really grapple with how things have been broken and how they can do things differently. Now, Tonglo, you know, he sent me some information in terms of their newsletter. And so in terms of patrons, He's raised around $1,700 so far this year. He's spent about 5,000 paying other writers primarily. Uh, he has around just under 3,000 subscribers. Readership for pieces on his site veer from around 2,000 for Eric Anderson, who's a Fluxus artist, quite obscure. By, this is by his, his term and to around 33,000 for a really amazing piece he did on Jim O'Rourke. Um, and he admits to me, he said, the model isn't working. If by working, we mean getting lots of money, you know, or even by page views. Mm -hmm. But he says, you know, my goal is to like, you know, I don't want to subject myself to, to capitalism in a way that's de dehumanizing. Where, you know, I'm trying to cover a wide range of music within the experimental music world, I'm trying to be exclusive both in terms of coverage and writers. And, you know, then he, a little bit more discussion with him later, he's talking about how they're gonna do some merch, try and raise some, some money by t-shirts. You know, reality is, you know, he's a relatively younger guy, you know, so he's got the time and can do this right now, you know? And the hope is that that model can become a bit more economically stable. I really hope that he finds a way to do that because I think if he does, other publications that have ignored that kind of approach that he has will have to start paying attention a bit more. Well, that's successful over there because that's the that's the big problem that we face in in terms of how things are run in the mainstream kind of not even just in the mainstream but in the in the in terms of the things that have traffic, the larger things they are there's always an economic model. I mean, RA, we all know RA is sustained primarily by ticket sales, you know? So you guys are in a completely different scenario now. You know, you have to kind of find a new way. You have to adjust your model, you know what I mean? I don't, you know, some people have gripes with that. Personally, I was like, well, good for them. They find a way to make it work, you know what I mean? And this is the thing. Everybody needs to find a way to make these models work. Uh, Tone glows, I think, is pretty consistent. There are some patchiness every now and then since, you know, the interview format can just end up being like a chat and not as deep and investigative as the Jim O'Rourke piece that they did. You know, so it's dependent on the writer and the writer's skill. But I see a lot of other newsletters are quite patchy and a lot of other newsletters are just kind of one person kind of griping a bit and grumbling a bit about where they think things should be and they're like, give me some money, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's like, you know, <laughs> and I have about 20 or 30 newsletters in, in, in my inbox. And, you know, honestly, I look at most of them for like five seconds and don't dig in because there's no like, okay, okay, you've got me with this, you know what I mean? And that's why, you know, Water and Music is so great because she has so much information in there that's nowhere else, you know? And so I'm always like, what's in this? And I'll always, you know, I'll take a few minutes to pay attention and I'll click on some of her links and she does a great job. So the newsletter model can work, but it, 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 there's one example of how it's kind of working, but 
still needs to find it leg, its legs. And I think, you know, we need to, somebody the other day when we were having a chat here for Unsound Labs suggested that maybe a good thing would be for a bunch of the newsletters to come together and kind of form like a little conglomerate, you know, and maybe that could be like a new place that people go to where there's like, you know, maybe 10 or, or you know, 12 newsletters together in one kind of thing. And I think, you know, collectivism is key. It's the way forward. I think, you know, we've got to start looking at models that aren't based on this old hierarchical system. I think um, the future's there. I mean, a lot of people talking about this. Matt Dryhuis did a piece in Crack recently where he was talking about the ownership economy and headless brands and how even um, a lot of venture capitalists are looking at these kind of models, you know? So it's definitely the way forward is collectivism. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of one thing that I would say we should all start looking at. And at that point, I'll let somebody else come in and <laughs> continue. So if newsletters are, I mean, I do think it's, yeah, if newsletters are one model that we're talking about, and I do think in general, like a theme I'm kind of picking up on here, which like, um, something I think I've like thought many times myself, like going through this whole like writing thing or whatever, but I also think it's like coming here again, is like, uh, it's a lot of it is like, it's like almost like getting caught up in labels because I would argue that like there are many, many people doing work that is like journalism or as is, is achieving the same goals that music journalism kind of purports to archiving and educating, but it's just being called, uh, it's just like being called something different. Like it's being called like a, a newsletter or like a vlog or a meme account or something like this, but actually like all of these are forms of cultural commentary and journalism. And then when you talk to these people, it's like, well, I'm not a critic, I'm not a journalist, all this stuff, because like somehow those, those words are like loaded with a, like you have to go through some sort of like initiation process. So you have to be in a, you know, you have to be, have blah, blah, blah on your paycheck or something in order to be a, like that. When, if you like, I mean, speaking as like, yeah, anyway. When really, like the people that are that, there's actually no difference well, except for like a, a label. So, like, a so it, yeah, it is also political. I mean, that's face down politically. I mean, especially in the UK and the US, we've been completely let down. By but we also, as readers, have the choice to, as like consumers of this kind of stuff, we have like the power, really, I guess, to define as like consumers of information what to us is journalism and what to us is not. So instead of instead of saying like these larger institutions are failing than saying like what new platforms are starting and like, you know, are we like patronizing them or like, and do I have a skill set that could like help it? But anyway, but um, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, Lucas, I'm interested to know uh, from your perspective, what are kind of like um, forms of storytelling um, or that are like adding context or doing this job of archiving about music, music media, as we've been calling it, that like you enjoy, that you've gotten something from, that you kind of like champion or that you're interested in, in seeing more from in the future? I might be super old school because I just love the old plane, like an article, I think. <laughs> And like hearing about like newsletters and podcasts and vlogs, I just feel like it's already being there like a newsletter for me mm. is just a blog and uh even i even read them in the same same way like 13 years ago i would read blogs on a google reader and now i need uh, now i read uh, newsletters on my gmail and it, it's almost the same and yeah. i don't, don't feel don't feel like if change match and it's a welcome um not innovation but like a welcome comeback um what like, do you think contributed to that? Because as you were like part of the kind of like, because yeah, there was that like blog boom that kind of like happened. I, for, I think like, we just missed this personal thing, like not being constrained by any um, like rules set by the, the magazine or we just can't get the pitch across to someone. And with a newsletter, it's like a blog. It's just, yeah, I'm just going to send it away. And mm -hmm. It's there. I can share what what I really want. And yeah, it might not be edited. Um, and it sometimes might be a bit meandering and going in some weird directions, but there's a, there's a human behind it. And it's uh, also really, really nice to read. But yeah, it doesn't feel um, that it's something um, 
it's something new, but it's 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 welcome. Like for me, two big moments in, in music journalism, like in my life, were when the Google Reader was shut down, and that was a disaster for me. I was subscribing to almost anything I can find, and I was reading a lot of reviews. Um, and for me, because I was doing curatorial work, like I wasn't really reading them for enjoyment, uh, and they all blurred together. But I just knew what records are out, who's doing the mm -hmm. promo cycle. Um, and I was also reading those reviews that I didn't know who the artist is, like what, this, what scene it is or uh, they're coming from. Um, and I, I had some bits of information I could, I could later use. But for, for pleasure, like the second, second very sad um, situation happened, tiny mixtapes shut down. And I thought this was like a That's super a creative, super well-written and experimental platform that will really go wild with how you can talk about music. And I mm -hmm. also, um, I also really miss it. But like with all those advancements, with everything that, that's happening now, I still, what I love the most, I, like a really good long form feature I put on the record by the artist that I'm reading about and I just read. <laughs> And that's why I don't really like YouTube. I don't like podcasts because I have this, this FOMO. I got this, I need to listen to everything. Uh, and when I'm like that's listening to, very interesting. to a YouTuber, I'm like, okay, you could have just r write a piece and I would read it in five minutes. And instead I'm listening to this 40 minutes, I could spend listening to the record. So I'm, if, uh, if like, um, I don't know, the like classic magazines could come back, that would be, that would be yeah. perfect. I'd like to add something to, to what you just said, Lucas. Uh, it can it can sound a little bit obvious, but a good story is a good story. It, it, I mean, you can have it whether in, in a long form or whether in TikTok or Instagram stories. As media persons, I don't know, as uh, people who write or who work with music, uh, at least this is what I try to do is to think on platform, not to adequate what I'm doing to, but uh, to tailor my subject, my, 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 my material to it. So if I'm, if I'm writing something, if I'm searching something that is related, that could, could work better in Instagram stories, I'll do that, but not trying to adequate it, much more trying to shape it to Instagram stories. Uh, and also, I think we must go where people are in some sort of way. Uh, I'm not saying that we just need to move to TikTok or Thriller or because these are platforms from five years from now, everything will be changing. But we must need to pay attention to these movements because music happens there also. Uh, if I'm about to write something about K-pop, I don't know, I surely I had to go to TikTok and I'm not a TikToker at all, but I have to talk to my cousin who's 15 years old and maybe he will help me out with this. Uh, and just another little thing, once we were talking about making things work out, um, for instance, with newsletters, uh, and, I, and I think this is a really interesting point that Kamal raised up. Um, the thing is, once we, today, if we look at the journalism or music media scenario in a whole global view, um, and I'm talking also about the global south, mainly in Portuguese and Spanish language media, uh, we do have a lot of different uh, biases working on, and I think this is cool. Uh, and also in English speaking media, we do have people who come from different upbringings and backgrounds writing and producing content. This is really, really cool. But um, we need to think, we need to think about making things work out because a lot of people who can bring a lot of different diff thoughts to this, to this media, that said, a lot of diversity is deeply connected to people who need to pay the bills by the end of the month. So uh, you cannot expect that you, your media will be diverse if you don't, if you're not able to pay a good wage for these people who are writing from, I don't know, from some neighborhood that's so far from Sao Paulo, it's a huge city here in Brazil. I'm, for, I'm from Sao Paulo. I'm telling this about Brazil as a whole. It's a huge country. So. Yeah, that, that is the, the last point I, I'd like to add. It's a very good point, absolutely, yeah. And I also think, I think something that you were saying earlier is kind of brings me back to, to what Crystal was saying initially about Sherry's newsletter, this idea that kind of like everybody is an expert in a way. And I think that like, 
um, maybe there's like a shift in perspective almost that like needs to happen um, from just like seeing everybody that's kind of like involved in your local community or like let's use music community as like an expert in something and having like something specific and unique to say about whatever their like given area of expertise is maybe yeah exactly like maybe it's knowing something about TikTok or it's like a platform that like is kind of ephemeral but they're an expert in it now you know um and I, but I would also say that like yeah and also talking about that's kind of like yeah and also talking about like all of these yeah new things or whatever people can do um with music journalism I also think like yeah obviously the the issue of people getting paid and being able to make a living off of it is like huge and if you have like all of this other stuff that you have to deal with um just like paying your bills and all of this stuff like who has the time to then like be like oh i'm gonna code a character and the first the character is gonna like teach you about this record it's like it's like yeah i mean you want to do that but it's like that is exhausting and there needs to be like a way to think about finding the people that are that are experts in their specific things and maybe haven't already put it out there in the world and like getting resource to them, I guess, like early so that they can just like go off and do that experimental thing, but it's like with a budget, I guess, but um, yeah. You were gonna say something. Please. Yeah, just a little bit. This is a, such a huge here in Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a mostly black country. If you look at uh, the, 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 the percentage of the population and ethnic groups, but once you look to the newsrooms, there are, there are so few black people, and uh, once you, you come to talk, you come to think about uh, this. We, we just talked about uh, making a live off of it. It's so hard to think that we won't change this this landscape if you don't if, if you don't think also about making it work. Like uh, I, we can do it for passion, but mm. if it's a work, if it's a job, uh, we need to think also about. Uh, how to make it uh, make it a living of it? Definitely. Um, just to kind of like go back to to the point that we were like getting at originally. Um, uh, I know that we're kind of like running out of time, so I want to make sure that we have time to to kind of like wrap things up a little bit. Um, so yeah, so Crystal, you've already kind of like mentioned um, newsletters and podcasts as kind of like different form formats that you appreciate are there any other kind of like people that are doing storytelling or kinds of storytelling specifically about music that like you're excited by or you see some kind of like potential in um or you can also like talk about your own work um like contributing to black band camp or doing moods or all of these kinds of things and i guess you could also come at it from the angle of uh i guess like what you wanted to like fulfill that wasn't being fulfilled with these kinds of formats um, so I think that we, when folks were talking about how podcasts are kind of just reimagined uh, radio shows and newsletters are reimagined um, blogs, it got me thinking about uh, other forms of older media. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a scene published in Detroit by Cornelius Harris from Submerge for a couple of years called The Scene. Um, in which they went over and like kind of did like local perspectives on local music happenings um, and also just like cultural things that are happening. Um, and I think in, in, in a lot of ways, like we kind of have to think about um, what zine culture represented and kind of what it looks like in a digital age. And I think that Instagram- totally, yes, that's a great point. Um, and kind of filling out that like visual, like uh, visual gap, but I think it would, be advantageous um, mm -hmm. of, of local reporters and local writers um, to retake up that format of zine making. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that pe pe people hate in Instagram, um, people hate social media, but it's just kind of, you can either adapt with it or you can kind of be angry at it. You know what I mean? So I think that there are like certain Instagram accounts that I think are doing a lot of work around um, reporting um, and updating, um, but talking about podcasts again, there's a one There's one that I really like called Heat Rocks, um, and that's with Morgan Rhodes, Rhodes and Oliver Wang. And what that's doing is taking, um, it's not always a musician, um, it's just like a cultural figure. And that person is talking about 
an album that has had an impact in their life. Um, and I really enjoy that. Um, and with Black Bandcamp, that's kind of had an organic growth into a publication. You know, at first it was a database and then they identified a need to do more writing around the artists that they were like um, publishing in the database. Um, thank you, Gamal. Um, and so it's, it's finding the need and it's filling the need. And it's kind of always coming back to the idea that um, as long as you're putting forth something like quality, it's gonna kind of stand the test of time. Um, I think it's, I don't know. I think about this a lot, um, kind of like the role, my role as a writer um, and if my goal is to, uh, what's, it, what's it called, progress my individual career or if my goal is to document and really show love to this music form that we are all dedicated mm. to. Um, so when I like do that analysis, but also consider what everyone's saying is you have to be able to pay your bills, you have to be able to eat, um, you have to be able to essentially like survive long enough to keep putting forth the cultural things that you're producing. Um, and that really does concern me, kind of as someone who's coming into the field um, in 2020, you know, it's like I have no real memory of how things were like five years ago or 10 years ago, or when you could write and just write and survive. But I think there's um, a lot of skill stacking I'm seeing happening um, with folks in my generation. Um, so it's like doing a lot of different things a little bit to kind of make ends meet. Um, but yeah, so I think I'm thinking of that podcast, Ash Lauren's writing, Sherry Who's writing, um, and just kind of other folks who are in Black Band Camp um, and other folks who are kind of just taking it amongst themselves to kind of keep up with this cultural production. Um, but also feeling a, quite pessimistic um, about the sustainability of um, most of these ventures. So I wish I kind of had the answer, you know, any real like concrete plan going forward, but it's just, we're in survival mood right now. And I think that things are shifting in such quick, quick ways that um, only time will tell. Mm -hmm. So I see that we're, yeah, we're, we're a little bit over here. So I guess I wanted to, to just end things up by having kind of like a free, like if there's anything that you really wanted to touch on on this topic that we didn't get to or something that I didn't ask that you kind of like wanted the opportunity to say, this is kind of just like a free, um, a free for all, uh, I guess, if, if anybody else has anything that they'd like to add. And then afterwards, we'll be in the Discord chat and we can also, I, there's a bunch of like links to stuff that I wanted to talk about here, but I didn't get to, so we can share them there. And if anybody is watching this question mark, uh, then, you know, we can like talk more there. But anyway, open question period here now, yeah. For discussion. So um, one thing that um, I was thinking a lot about, like when we we're talking about um, like people getting to know each other um, in the scenes or like uh, working together and then writing about themselves. Um, I, I, guess I, no so. I, I noticed something on um, at, on the um, like technological websites, like um, uh, I don't know, like video games websites, like websites that. Uh, write about uh, new smartphones or whatever, they always say, I mean, not always, but some of the bigger publications, they always say, this was sent by this and that company. Um, and we used uh, like a digital version or like a physical version. And our company gets money from links um, below, blah, blah, blah. Like, mm. I think it's much more clear um, where the stuff comes from. And uh, as a Polish person, and and I know this is the, this is like very visible sentiment in the Polish scene that we are invisible, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like when you read, like all the media that we read are the Western media, and they mostly focused on what's released um, in the West. And um, I know that this is slowly changing, and sometimes you might see some Polish artists uh, crack the the walls and get in. Um, 
but still many um many people think that they're not good enough that they mm. don't that they don't deserve the success because they see all those brilliant acts a and they want this but they don't know that this person actually uh worked at this office and now they're a famous dj uh, or this person um has some uh, financial background that uh helps them i don't know like buy pieces or premieres <laughs> or appear at, at streams and uh this is invisible and uh, quite hurtful to uh to some of the smaller acts that have that have this re real frustration that they don't know how uh how to do it how to who to speak to like they might send some you know promos to the like info or hello emails and they're like oh they didn't pick me like i'm not worthy of a review um while there's actually in the west there's like this whole network of pr agencies that are working really hard um to to make it happen for the artists yeah i think that's like really i mean i am always like ter yeah the transfer, I mean, we didn't really get to go into it, but I do think the transparency thing, um, which you know, Crystal was kind of speaking about in the beginning and this whole objectivity thing, and also what you just brought up here, yeah, where music comes from when it's recommended, does it come from a PR? What are people's relationships? And all of this stuff, obviously there needs to be like way more transparency, but I guess kind of like similarly to what you were saying and like, I don't know how to create like a sustainable model for music media. I, I also, I mean this, I think the second ladder is an easier problem to solve, but I, I do wonder what that transparency would look like, like literally like on the thing and how could you do it in a way that wouldn't descend into just like me complete mess, like, like, um, because then you have start asking, like, I mean, beyond just like disclosing which PR you got sent some music from, if, if that's what, if that's how you get your music, then but then when you get into the nature of people's relationships and like brands or have you done a radio show on this radio station that you're writing i don't know stuff like because it it is similarly like in order to the people that like aren't very like moneyed i think in this like industry are kind of doing all of these like little different like wearing many hats to survive and then when you're wearing all these different hats then you're also like uh, very much like involved in a bunch of different things that are like cross contaminated. And so then how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you express that? Like literally what does that transparency look like in a literal sense? Or is it like a switch in perspective, which is just like changing the expectations of what music media is, but that's all the time we have today, I guess. <laughs> Um, and yeah, maybe we can talk more about that in the, in the discord or, um, or yeah, I don't know. I, I guess, uh, does anybody, is there anybody watching this that has any questions? I think I was supposed to do that. I don't know. I think not, but I guess speak now or forever hold your peace. If you have a question, you want to be on video. I don't know. I think that's fine. Okay. What am I supposed to do after the end? Thank you. Bye-bye. Please stay muted for five to 10 seconds. Okay. All right. So goodbye. I'm going to stay muted for five to ten seconds. Goodbye. Thank you everyone so much for doing this. This is great. Thank you. Thank you.